Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lorenzo Acellini from the University of Washington, where he is the Director of Interventional Research and one of the key members of the CTO program with Bill Lombardi and Kay Kearney. So, uh, Lorenzo, thanks again for taking part of Sensei Podcast and welcome. Hi, Manos. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's very exciting to share my story with you. Thank you. And actually, you know, I've been... You know, you've been a good friend and collaborator for many, many years. But for people who don't know you that well, I think it would be great to start from the beginning. When you do your training, and then I know you had a very exciting course over many continents and cat labs and places. So how, how did that go? Yeah, so it's a long story, but uh, let's try to make it short and easily understandable. So I am Italian. I was born and raised in Italy and studied medicine at the University of Padua Medical School in northeastern Europe, in, in northeastern Italy, close to, um, to Venice. Um, after that, I moved to Spain, to Barcelona, where I did my cardiology training. I spent five years there. I also did the, um, a master's in research methodology um, and biostatistics. Then I spent two years in Montreal, Canada, the Montreal Heart Institute to get a training in uh, interventional cardiology. Um, and so there I spent uh, basically six months doing research and the rest of the time during uh, uh, general coronary intervention. And also in the second year, I had uh, structural training. After that, I got a job as an attending faculty at San Raffaele Hospital in um, in Milan, Italy, in the group led by Antonio Colombo, where I learned um, CTO PCI by one of with one of the pioneers in the field, Mauro Carlino, one of my mentors, and uh, and then um, after that, I decided after three and a half years, I decided to make the big leap to jump the ocean and come to the to to the United States of America. Uh, I spent another year um, as a research and clinical fellow in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York with uh, uh, Samin Sharma. And, uh, and then after that, I took a job as associate professor of medicine and uh, director of complex coronary intervention at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. And after that, just a few months ago, I joined the University of Washington here in Seattle as uh, Director of Interventional Cardiology Research, and I work, as you mentioned, in the CTOPCI with Bill and Kate. So that's the long story short. Oof, that was an impressive course, and obviously that shows you know, a lot of uh, creativity, a lot of influences. So w- w- first of all, go back one step. You know, why did you decide, you trained in structural, right? So how do you decide to focus on CTO and not uh, do structural, for example? Yeah, so one of my uh, attendings in Spain, uh, he had trained uh, the Montreal Heart Institute in structural. And those were the days, I remember, around 2009, 2010, when structural heart disease intervention was uh, being born as a specialty. So a lot of people got really excited about it. So I was recommending, you know, this is the future. You should train in that. And actually, I liked it. The problem was that uh, when I joined San Rafael Hospital in Milan, there were already four different people doing structural uh, at some level. Four of them were doing TAVR, two or three of them even mitral intervention, not only mitral clip. That, remember, it was a, a lab where a lot of the first developments and advances in uh, structural intervention uh, took place. So there was really no space for me there. And for some reason, when I was in Montreal doing my training in uh, coronary intervention, I was, you know, it was a very solid program, very comprehensive, atherectomy, bifurcation, left main, etc. The only thing that was not taught there was CTOPCI for some unknown reasons to me. Uh, that, you know, caught my attention. It, it really intrigued me. Maybe because there is a lot of thinking and planning before the procedure and a lot of changes of strategy happened during the case. Um, so when I joined uh, Sarah Fell as an attending, I was enthusiastic to learn CTO PCF from one of the masters, uh, Mauro Carlino. Perfect. And so you did. 
So how was the experience? How how did it go? How did you uh, incorporate? You know what uh, Mauro taught into what you already learned before. How did that go for you? So well, it, it was very easy. So what I learned before was just reading some articles. I don't think your books were out there yet when I uh, when I trained. So I could just learn a lot of articles, a lot of literature. So I had like a quite good, reasonable, I would say. Um, um, theoretical background on the thing, but then it was all hands on. And I was always, uh, I always tell people, you know, I was extremely lucky because I was able to learn CTO PCI in a limited amount of time because I was basically working five days a week for three and a half, uh, years with kind of a proctor that he was really teaching me every single day. We had a CTO together, whereas others unfortunately need to ask for a proctor to come maybe once every two, three, four months. And so the learning is much slower. So, you know, it's a combination of hands-on training. Uh, I was an avid reader of the every single paper that came out on the on the topic uh, those years. And I participated in as many meetings as possible, first as an attendee and then as faculty. And then I reinforced one very important thing, I think, that is reinforcing uh, practical learning by doing research uh, like I did and was involved in many registries. So you really need to know a lot because when you write the papers and the reviewers come to you with a lot of very insightful and sometimes hard comments, you really need to study and reflect on your data on the specialty a lot. I think that is like a 360 degrees thing for me. Absolutely. And I think you're, you're one of the very few people who actually combines that, you know, the passion for research, you know, very strong research background, you're publishing a lot, making new insights in CTO and complex PCI, at the same time, performing at a very high level. So, as you said, many, many um, power to that. However, it's not done very often. And why not? And what are the ways to encourage people to do more of this route? Yeah. So, um, the, a lot of people, most physicians actually, are into medicine because they want to learn how to heal people and there's nothing wrong with that actually that's the, our mission so for sure most people are mostly uh drawn and attracted by the clinical aspect of of a um, coronary intervention in this case cto pci um, so uh, of course in that in that area clinical training like structure fellowship are the way to go um, unfortunately, I know that in the U.S. there is just a half a dozen, maybe a little bit more of these uh, CTO programs, and even less so around the world. In, in many countries, there's no possibility to get uh, any dedicated CTO uh, training. Um, so for training purposes, I think that the, the best thing is either you learn on the job with a senior partner who's an expert in CTO PCI, or at least you try to get you know some proctoring from other experts in your country. Uh, in Europe, is is quite easy. Even international proctor can move around very easily. And in North America, it's, it's quite easy too. Um, I think attendance and a dedicated meeting like uh, TCT, uh, CTO Plus, etc. Is, is very important because there is a, a, you know, a group of, uh, there's a grouping of all these experts in a few days talking about the uh, CTO PCI altogether. So it's very easy to get to know these people, you and other uh, leaders in our specialty like um, uh, Bill, etc. So you can approach these guys and talk to them and uh, and most of, of them will be very uh, open to, to, to share their insight. Uh, so I think also learning, uh, you know, learning on your own. I keep reading your books, for example, uh, a lot of articles that come out. So I do a lot of homework and um, your YouTube channel is a fantastic resource uh, for learning. For research, it's a bit more tricky because um, when uh, you started and then also when I started maybe, let's say, eight years ago, uh, getting an interest in CTO PCI, um, not much research had been done before. So it was relatively easy to really get a good institutional database with your data, your case series, and get it published. After a while, it became a bit more tricky. We started building like multi-center registry. I led a multi-center registry in Europe and also involved you uh, in a few p uh, papers, like around 2,000 patients, like seven, registry, seven centers. But as the time went by, I mean, and you are the testimony of it, you know, it's all about mega registries, really capturing 
uh, a broader clinical practice. So now it's very hard for someone who wants to come up with uh, their institutional registry and publish it. So now the key is collaboration, huge uh, volumes of patients and cases where all a spectrum of uh, the whole spectrum of CTO intervention is captured. So uh, that uh, broader, uh, also degree of experience and ex expertise of the operators are represented. So my advice would be if somebody wants to start learning uh, to do research in CTO PCI would be to join one of these big registers like Progress CTO, for example. So you can really put your two cents in this. And after a while, you get also insight by reading the papers that the group authors and the publishes. And so then you can come up with your own research ideas and present it to the committee. But as you said, learning how to actually write papers, you know, obviously you write at extremely high level and very polished papers and get to the point, you know, there's an art in learning that. So how did you learn that? Was it on your own? Did you work with some people? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Manos. You know, um, I'm not a native speaker and, uh, and neither are you. So for you and I, was was uh, extra hard compared with the uh, uh, native English speaker. So the, I think the way I learned might not be necessarily the way that everybody can learn, but it worked for me and maybe it can help uh, others is uh, reading a lot of papers. If you really read a lot of papers, maybe you will not learn the colloquial English you need to use when you hang out with your friends, when you go to a restaurant, etc. But you will learn very polished academic in, uh, scientific English. So that way, um, I just started uh, imitating like sentences from others, like not, not the exact word, of course, but you know the phrasal verbs and things like that. So you improve your English. Maybe you can even uh, take uh, dedicated English classes. I didn't do it, but you know it's it's it works for someone, and that way you uh, you learn a bit the you know the words, the expression. Then it's very important you start writing. And if I start reading the if I now read the papers that I wrote like ten years ago. I would just, you know, be embarrassed by, you know, the, the language that I use. But little by little, by writing hundreds of paper like you and I did, that's the way to improve um, your uh, your Eng academic English. And I can tell you, when I was submitting papers, maybe 10, 8 years ago, my paper was accepted despite the, the, the quality of the content that I believed I put in. It was accepted after 4, 5th, 6th, 7th journal. Now, I know exactly... This kind of paper is not good for that journal. It's good for this other journal. I submit the paper. Many times I get it accepted after one or two rounds of revision. In the first journal, I submit the paper or maybe the second. Rarely goes for more than four journals because you start understanding also the dynamics in the in the in all these journals, all, what the editor-in-chief likes, what he or she does not like, you know. So you really start to know the behind the scene and uh, the unspoken rules of the game. Absolutely. And again, you've done it very, um, very well. And I think, in my mind, at least the key to success to this is when you write a paper, it's not about the paper, but actually the message that you try to convey, how to make it very simple. You know, still, as you probably observe in some of the fellows you work with, they just want to fill the discussion with 20 pages of stuff that's not necessarily relevant. So how do you learn how to cut through the clutter and go focus on the message that you need to convey? Well, it, it's, it's a hard skill. So I noted that especially in uh, early in my career, I was writing too long discussions and uh, putting stuff that was not really required. Uh, as a consequence, my mentors <clears throat> at uh, the Montreal Heart Institute, I learned from Marc Jolicoeur and Hang Lee. They helped me a lot. They trained in, in uh, Ivy Leagues, uh, Ivy League universities in the U.S. So they really told me, you know, this is not fundamental. You should cut it. But no, it's like, I don't want to do it because to me it's fundamental. It's like, it becomes like your child, right? So you should be able to emotionally detach from the paper and maybe even ask for um, uh, a mentor support or even one of your colleagues, a friend, that, m of course, they need to have, like, basic background on the field, like, on, like being a physician and cardiologist, but they do not need to be Manos Brilakis, Oh, Dimitri Carpaliosi or Bill Lombardi to understand what's really in there. They need, just need to have like some degree of understanding of academic medicine and how papers are written. And um, they will like, will be able to tell you, you know, this, this is just too long. I don't think this is needed because this just reiterates what you said with this almost the same word in that other section. So um, 
that that that's a good way asking for external feedback um so um that for example my wife is also in uh, uh, academic medicine and sometimes she works in a totally different uh, area she works in uh, epidemiology and immunization and sometimes she sends me her papers because the reviewer asked to cut a bit and so you know watching from outside you get an external perspective you're more cold-blooded you can be more um uh, Solomonic and just cut here and there. And, um, that, that's something that, that takes to do it on your own alone. It takes years anyway. Perfect. Now, are there, can you give some examples where actually the papers made an impact on the care of your patients or other people's patients for that matter? Yeah. For example, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind was really one small, I don't know, maybe it was a case series of two patients that you published in, I think, cardiovascular revascularization medicine a few years ago on the possibility that a cabbage patient can suffer tamponade and actually die, right? Um, so that is just a case report. And, you know, many people think that case report are not worth spending time on, even neither writing them, publishing them, but also by, um, reading them. I believe it's totally wrong in a so technical specialty like CTO PCI. You can learn a lot from them. I mean, uh, when that was written like five years ago or something like that, I think that, and still today, a lot of people think that, oh, you're safe. Cabbage patient, they have an open pericardium. It was removed partially so they can just, uh, you know, accumulate more uh, blood and they don't have any outcome, adverse outcome. This is uh, couldn't be farther from the truth. Actually, it's even worse when they, they have loculated effusion. Uh, I think it was brought up in another podcast of yours. And, uh, you know, that, that is an example where a case report really raised my attention on that. And I started looking in the literature, asking around to other uh, more experienced colleagues. And I found that that was uh, actually happening. And so now I'm more wary of that. I mean, I, I've been for a few years already. Other than that, I think like large series like... Um, Large series uh, exploring, for example, uncommon complication or specific techniques like retrograde through Lima. What's the risk? I mean, each of us has maybe done one or two, three cases, but some some of us maybe oh it always went fine, but others have had complications. So the good way to is to pull all these cases together, and there, there are articles in the literature on these topics. So if you read them, you can really get a three hundred sixty degree view on the topic and know what can happen even if you didn't uh, experience it or maybe you didn't even think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, uh, it's interesting you say that because most people I've talked to, including in this podcast, you know, when you ask them, how do you prepare for the case? They look at the films, they look at the history, which of course you have to do. But I don't know of many people who actually then go into the literature and see, okay, what has been done for this kind of anatomic subgroup I'm dealing with and learn how to do it. So as you said, this can have a direct uh, implication in day-to-day -day practice. Yeah. But how do you prepare? I know you've done quite a few cases. You work one of the premier groups in the world. Um, how do you prepare for your cases right now? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It comes up a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I think each of us prepare in a different way. Um, so I tend to, I need to re repeat, even when I was in med school, I, I was not studying just once or twice. Many times I was studying three times the whole uh, uh, syllabus of the course. So here's the same thing. <clears throat> I tend to study the angiogram just maybe a few minutes a day. Uh, I see the patient in the clinic for the first time. And uh, I tend to write down in my note, oh, we're going to go integrate first. If that fails, uh, there is no landing zone for uh, ADR. We need to go retrograde. So I put down a hierarchy of strategies. Then uh, a few days after, or anyway, just a few days before the, the intervention, maybe the weekend before I see all my cases for the next week, and uh, I, I open the angiograms and I look over the, um, uh, I look at the case and uh, I confirm or modify the initial plan. And finally, again, on the day of the intervention, maybe at 7.30 a.m. before starting the, the, the workday, in my office, I review all the angels and uh, I decide oh, we're going to do this, this and that. And then I go over again with, with the staff and the fellows just before the case. So probably three or, or even more, four times and uh, before the case, I review all these, uh, these angiograms. And I think by doing so, it really gives myself enough time to truly evaluate all the possible options and bailout strategies. And then do you get nervous? I know you've done a lot of cases now. Do you still get nervous with cases or you overcome that? Yeah, I think that 
uh, if you enter a CTO PCI case the same way you enter a right art cath or a coronary angiogram, you're just reckless. I mean, let's face it, it's not the same thing. It's not the same uh, level of risk. You need to be a bit tense, okay? At the same time, being too nervous does not help either, of course. So when I go into a case, I have a good mix of, as I call it, relaxed tension that allows me to carry out the procedure without being overconfident. But at the same time, um, you know, I don't want to be uh, too nervous because that does not help either if you start shaking while you have to puncture the proximal cap with a high tip low wire, right? So I, I think that, you know, of course, over the year, you get less and less anxious, but still, I never go in a single case that I'm going to say, oh, it's a slam dunk. Anything can happen. And then what do you use when you teach your fellows, when you teach the other trainees? Do you use simulation? Do you use them didactics? Do you watch them? What is your favorite um, method for teaching them how to do these procedures? So in general, simulators like with silicon models are only available in specific settings. Like if a company comes to give you, you know, uh, uh, someone gives you a lecture, a demonstration or at conferences. So that's not, a, unfortunately, it's not the easiest way, most consistent way to get um, exposed for the fellow to hands-on training. So I tend to do a lot of drawings. Um, first of all, when they start, so here we also have a CTO PCI fellowship. Okay. So these people who come are already full-blown interventional cardiologists, early career, but they know to do rota, bifurcation, uh, uh, primary PCI, MCS, etc. So when they come here, um, I advise them to, uh, look, and so now we have, for example, your books, uh, particularly the one on CTO PCI is very comprehensive and uh, it's very systematic, step by step. So there's really everything, all the complications that can happen, all the devices that you can use, all the techniques and especially all the algorithms. So the way I learned when I was like two, three years in the job was uh, reading your book and uh, seeing if uh, I remember all possible things that can, you know, all of the ways to troubleshoot. Uh, a lesion. And so if I didn't know something, I would make a mental note. So by l reading that book over and over again, I got to have like a bird's eye view on the, on the specialty. So I always recommend them to read the book. So of course, then the application, uh, you know, there's not going to be an algorithm, a computer algorithm that's going to tell us exactly you need to do A, B, C, D, N, E, F, etc. So then there is, must be some, you know, talking with us. And fortunately, this, our CTO fellows almost only do CTO PCI. So even if there is like both of them will end up with 150, uh, this year we have two, probably 150 CTOs, CTO PCIs each. There is the off time in between cases. And also they, they don't do cases every, CTO cases every day. So we can meet, review the previous cases. I find it's very helpful to review old cases. Um, then for them, to really understand some rare finding, rare complication, very rarely used technique is good to create PowerPoint presentation of that. So that I, that's also what I do. I create a portfolio. I have a portfolio CTO and not only CTO PCI cases, PCI cases in general. When, whenever I do a, an interesting case, I put it together, maybe more or less like you do for your YouTube channel. I just keep it on my hard drive. So whenever somebody asks me about something that is containing one of these presentations, just share with them this PowerPoint. And if the fellows do the same thing, when they can go for an interview, they can already show what they've, they've done and that, you know, they are legit and they, they are exposed to uh, certain advanced techniques. And then, of course, they can use those presentations for uh, a symposium uh, or some uh, meeting, some conference. And they, it's already there. It's already there. So they don't have to a scramble at the last day. So it's a multi-pronged approach and uh, there is a lot of interaction between us faculty and the fellows. Perfect. I agree completely with you that actually spending the time to put the case into PowerPoint, first of all, you see things that you don't necessarily see during the case, at least I do several times, but then also helps you remember and you have it as a reference point for you and other people as well. Now, mm -hmm. despite all this, CTO PCI can be still frustrating, hard complications can happen. How do you deal with this? Have you found a way to deal with this? Do, do complications bother you, Mats? Uh, are you able to get through this? What is your approach? So, of course, complications <clears throat> take a hard toll on us as interventionalists. Uh, uh, if that would be the case, we shouldn't be allowed to practice medicine, okay? 
everyone reacts a bit differently. Uh, I personally become very sad and think about it continuously for a few days and even weeks. Um, you know, what if I did this? What if I didn't do that? That's maybe not the healthiest way to start dealing with a complication or with, you know, the mental stress that comes with it. But I think the best way to heal is to share your story with colleagues you respect because, you know, shame um, can only be overcome if you share things that you're not very proud of, like a complication. You're going to learn a lot because your colleagues, people who you, uh, you respect and they respect you, they will most likely cheer you up, share with you similar cases they had, uh, and also possibly teach you something, giving you a recommendation on alternative ways of how to be doing a similar case if it happens again. So it's sharing. Don't close <clears throat> uh, in your shell, but share your shame <laughs> uh, and your complication, your anger, your depression, whatever. If you start doing that, you're going to have a lot of help. You're going to build a community. You're going to see you as a human being. You're going to be vulnerable. And this is the first way to deal with that. And of course, then there, there is technical learning. Of course, maybe you you'd made a technical mistake and they will help you uh, analyzing it and uh, and identifying in it. Absolutely, and I actually can myself remember I had a, a death in, a pre in my previous institution, and actually <coughs> I wrote it up. Uh, the case went to peer review, so when the peer review came, I sent them the case report, and you know it's fascinating that actually I mean it was fine, but uh, I think that helped everyone feel more comfortable that what was supposed to happen happened, and that this was not taken lightly, but you actually took the time. To learn the most, and I think another person, I think Arashi Maran has said that the best way to honor the people who have a complication is to use the information so that similar things don't happen in other patients going down the line. That's absolutely right. I really admire people who do that, and uh, I, I think at some point I might have done that. It just does not come to my mind immediately, but um, you know, it's it's uh, it's at least a presenting at meeting. There are like complications meeting. Um, or there are some sessions called my worst CTO nightmare and things like that. So it's funny because when, maybe when you submit a paper, you don't get like an, like a human response because it's a, an academic, uh, a piece of paper. Also the reviewer maybe will be a bit more neutral. Uh, but at a complication, uh, course or, or talk, there is a lot of people who will come to you and, you know, tell you, you know, I've been there. I did even worse than you. You know, this really creates a sense of community, uh, being together, and uh, it makes you feel more human and more connected to the other. So that's the way to go, I think. Absolutely. And for people who are familiar, um, every summer there is a complications course at uh, um, the institution where Lorenzo is working. It's uh, usually mid-July. I think it's mid-July this year. Uh, the CRF complications course. And again, it's super highly recommended. You see a lot of cases that you wouldn't see otherwise. Tremendous learning and also support for yourself and for others. So strongly recommend that course to everyone who wants to get better and learn about complications specifically. Yeah. But switching on to teaching. So when you see someone come to you to, and says, I want to learn CTO PCI or I want to learn to do research with you, what makes you um, click? What makes it exciting for you to work with that person? Yeah. So uh, what excites me in a student is uh, the grit and the fire in their eyes. You can immediately tell if someone is around you just to get some positive evaluation, a tick in their checkbox and continue along their way of if they're really, truly excited to learn from you, to go the extra mile. These um, <clears throat> people uh, must be humble, okay? Uh, because at that stage in their training, they really don't know much. But at the same time, they should have ambitions and uh, they should not self-sabotage themselves out of lack of self-esteem. They must have a vague, uh, vague idea of what they want to become in the future and focus uh, early on <clears throat> in their career on specific subspecialty within interventional cardiology. So the era of jacks of all trades is over. You cannot be doing CTO PCI, critical link ischemia, mitral intervention, uh, renal denervation all at once. You have to commit and focus to one or two fields only and then take it from there. The way I did is that realizing that when I joined Sarafele, I could not 
uh, have been doing structural anytime soon because there were like four people ahead of me. I found a passion. Really, you need to be passionate about what you do. Something that you want to focus on even Saturday night when, you know, um, it's raining outside. You either watch a movie or maybe you, re you read the latest literature or you go to a meeting uh, just to learn from others, to network with them. And so you need to have grit and fire in your eyes. Fire in your eyes is basically the passion, okay? So that's what I'm looking for. And then um, if they have that, how much does it matter their hand skills, their, what is more important, their head skills, their passion, their mental uh, stability? What, what do you think is the most important of those factors for a CTO complex so, operator? Yeah, I think like up to maybe 10 or 20 years ago, there was a lot of emphasis put, uh, especially surgical specialty specialties in, uh, oh, he's got talent. He was born for that. He has amazing hands. I don't think that, uh, you know, unless you have like a physical condition that prevents you from moving your hands uh, uh, the way you want, I don't think that it's all in the hands, okay? It, there is a lot of cognitive aspect to it. There is a lot of reading, a lot of understanding. Um, the first step, of course, is uh, reading books and putting into practice, choosing the right technique in the, for the right and geographical procedural scenarios. But what we teach, and Billy is just amazing here uh, with the fellows and K2, uh, is basically... Um, Deciding not only how to uh, approach the case in the lab, but also how to manage and conduct yourself outside the lab, how to discuss with the referring physicians, how to deal with the cardiac surgeons, the other non-invasive cardiologists. There is a lot of debate recently uh, about uh, uh, downgrade of recommendation for PCI and the CTO PCI specifically. So it's not only about um, being able to perform the case, it's also a good patient selection, very good interaction with your colleagues and the administrator. Otherwise, your CTO program is not going to fly. Sure. And what excites you right now? You're in a new institution, obviously, uh, so it's a lot of, I'm sure, getting used to the local dynamics. But what are the most exciting things for you at this point and in the next near future? So some things have never changed. So what excites me the most is actually always being able to help patients provided. Uh, providing advanced therapies for their uh, coronary artery disease. Maybe these are patients that were turned down by other interventionists and surgeons. So really being able to see the patient before, in, usually in clinic, before and after the intervention is what really keeps me rocking. Seeing that I've, I've made you know, a meaningful change in their quality of life uh, and, uh, and what they can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, teaching younger generations of interventionists to do the same is it's just amazing because I can only touch one, two, three, four, five thousand of patients. But if I can train, and for this reason, like good mentoring and, and uh, fellowship programs are fundamental. If I can train two, three fellows per year, then they can go out in the community, uh, train two, three other people like on the job, like proctoring, et cetera. We can make a huge impact, amplified impact. Okay. So, one of the things I enjoy the most is also, as you pointed out, is research. It just motivates me to be a, a little bit better, to understand a little bit more what I'm doing, to improve a bit, because in general, big changes happen often slowly. So yesterday, I'm probably almost the same as today, but almost, and tomorrow I'm going to be almost the same. But if I look back at myself a year ago, five years ago, I surely made uh, a long way. Perfect. And then I know you've got all the influences, right? You've been in Canada, you've been in Italy, you've been in the U.S., many different places throughout your career. Do you think that's important to go to different countries and different people? Or it doesn't matter and you can still learn even if you stay in the same institution throughout the time? In the past, people tended to remain in the same place, uh, uh, especially in uh, very solid programs, uh, both in the U.S., uh, in Canada also, and uh, in Europe for sure. Uh, there is this uh, tendency to think that uh, if you have a strong program, you don't need your fellows to be trained in anything else because we have it all here. That could not be far further from truth because uh, there's no way you can be perfect in everything. There's always going to be somebody that is going to be better than you at another institution. So, um, you know, and if e even if you are the world leader in something, there's someone just as good or almost as good as you that can teach you a different perspective on the thing because 
after you do a thousand cases, maybe what you need has not been taught you by your mega expert, mega pro. Maybe you would have learned it if you went some somewhere else. And in general, going abroad or not depends a lot on a lot of things like your personal life circumstances, where you are. Of course, if you live in a small country um, outside the U.S., there are many small countries that just have like a one big heart center in their country and they, you know, they're limited. They can just learn at most what is taught there. So, of course, in that case, I would advise them to go uh, abroad. Uh, abroad or not, it, what matters is that you go to another place uh, to learn new things. And then if you are retained and hired back in the in the place uh, you trained, you can bring and add up to that institution. This is something, for example, where uh, I train at Montreal Heart Institute. Every single attending had done a fellowship, most of them in the U.S. in a different place, Duke, Harvard, University of California, etc. So that's the way to bring in more knowledge so you can really be the best version of yourself as a program. Absolutely. And then, you know, in your, in your, in your learning, uh, combining all these uh, sources together into one, what ends up being the things that you keep and the things that you don't? Is it the day-to-day -day practice? Is it what you read? What makes the most difference for you? So at this stage, at the beginning of my career, <clears throat> it made a lot of difference reading a, a, a paper uh, because, oh, for example, I don't know anything about uh, the outcome of CTOPCI in uh, instant stenosis. Okay, let's learn about that. Um, you know, being taught, uh, read books. But at this stage, a second period of like mid-career, I would say what matters the most is the interaction with peers, um, uh, you know, talking, sharing my cases, my experiences, and watching Bill's and Kate's cases. So I'm so lucky here. I work with some of the best interventionists in the world. We always peek in each other's labs or review during the case or after the case to review the procedures together. And I always learn something. Maybe I, I don't learn necessarily something I didn't know, but something that, oh, that's not my preferred way of doing that. But maybe it's just as good as what I did. But maybe in the 2000 case from now, my way cannot be used and I have to do the other one. So if I don't have anybody reminding me that, I will not be able to come to that conclusion. And so it's priceless, really. So it's sharing if you if you're you're the only city operator in your practice, you should go a lot of, to meetings and uh, interact. Uh, like Twitter uh, also allows interaction uh, outside the meeting, so social media or just calling a friend. Sometimes you share also bad cases with friends. You call uh, the other person and uh, you know you tell them this happened to me. I can send you the angiogram or even sometimes live during the case, if you have a very bad complication, you troubleshoot it everything in your algorithm and then you don't know what to do uh i will always think uh think ab about calling some more experienced colleague to to help me with that and speaking of social media i know you participate in many platforms what has been your experience mm -hmm. of this has it been useful has it been a time sink as some people say how useful did you find it as a learning tool oh yeah that's just uh, that's very important uh, even if you're not someone who posts a lot their cases i think priceless to be on social media nowadays because there is really a lot of high quality content maybe it's not moderated so you need to have like a bit of grain of salt to discern what really works for you what's been done by somebody who you respect uh, or not um for example i think that the single access technique for uh impella was published the first time as a tweet twitter post okay so you know people learned about that Really, the day it was developed um, by, I think, Jason Walmoth uh, by watching the case put on Twitter. So it's a great way to share cases. Uh, there is also, a, in all social media, there's a lot of uh, uh, like not so optimal things that happen, let's say. But um, if you have you know, uh, a bit of brain also, you can discern who to follow, who not to follow and what content you're interested in, you can develop also your online persona deciding, oh, I just read, I just watch what the others post, or I can comment, or I can post my own content. So, you know, you can decide who you want to be. Now, you're incredibly productive in the research arena, in the clinical arena, everywhere. And that obviously takes a lot of time, organization, effort, but how do you do it? 
<laughs> well, I mean, it's funny that you asked me because uh, you are the same way, but much more. Uh, probably because you, you, you probably sleep less than I do. And that, that's the key. Uh, I, unfortunately I need to sleep. So, um, so early in my, in my career, um, you know, I, I was not even married then, uh, I was married, but I didn't have, uh, my daughter yet. So that's maybe the years that you need to really push on the gas pedal and, uh, you know, work a lot, very hard. When you start having kids, it's very important that you maintain a uh, work-life balance, okay? So when I am at work, I am focused. I just, you know, um, I try to avoid spending time on social media, like for fun, like Facebook, this kind of thing. Um, I think I try to just to focus on my work. Then I go home, I spend time with my family. It's very important to me. Uh, they're the pillar of my, of my life, so I cannot fail them. So when I'm home, I just spend time with them. I give all myself to them, my wife and my uh, daughter. And then when they go to sleep, uh, I'm usually a night owl. So I tr- work, I give my best in the golden hours between nine and midnight usually. So I work a lot those hours, particularly during the weekend, because then I can catch up the next morning. And then in the morning, I cannot, I cannot function so well like you or others do. Um, and so I just wake up and go to work. But it's important that you carve out from your busy schedule some time to just, just focus on, on what matters to uh, the most to you. So if you're not, I mean, I'm a research person, so I love research and research involves also reading others paper, of course, or doing peer review. I do a lot of peer review. Uh, but if you're more clinically oriented, you can still learn a lot by studying those hours, reviewing your uh, previous cases, your next case in those hours. Now with these uh, uh, VPNs, you can connect to your packs and, and review the angiograms, write notes. So you can really make the most out of it. I think it's very important to compartmentalize. And uh, now is the moment to spend with my family. This is the weekend. I have to do this. I cannot be just checking the papers. If that paper of mine came out, uh, and I download the PDF or whatever while you're watching your, your daughter, uh, at the school rehearsal, for example, you need to be focused on that. So everybody will be happy. Perfect. And then what is your uh, way to distress? Do you exercise? Do you meditate? Do you, what do you do to distress from all the work slash uh, home activity? Yes. So in the past, I've been an avid runner. Uh, so whenever I could, I, I was out running. I ran uh, a few marathons, even a, a ultra marathon. But recently, a foot issue has been blocking me recently. Other than that, I enjoy uh, being in contact with nature, particularly hiking and being on the beach. And also love to go sailing when I have the chance. So whenever I, 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 I fix my foot issue, I will go back to running. Uh, but in the meantime, there is a lot of things. You know, if you just go here in the Pacific Northwest, it's so amazing. You can just go, you drive 10 minutes, you're out in the woods and in this beautiful forest. Or you can go to the beach. It's, it's really beautiful out here. So I derive a lot of pleasure, both alone and with my family, to actually engage in outdoor activities. Perfect. And what's your favorite book and your favorite movie? Uh, so favorite movie, uh, you know, it's hard. I, I can never answer uh, this question uh, right. <laughs> but I <laughs> recently, I have like a, a recently, uh, a recent favorite movie. Yeah, I recently watched Top Gun Maverick. And boy, that was really awesome. It was a high octane. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, but I don't, I not necessarily only enjoy like action movies, also some, some thriller and thriller movies or more, uh, introverted movies are, are, are nice for me, but you know, it's hard for me to choose one. And for books, you know, there are like medical books and no medical books for, um, medical books. It's very easy for me. I just think that your two manual CTO and no CTO, like the coronary intervention manual, just amazes very straight to the point. Um, <clears throat> a step-by-step, systematic, and I can really teach every possible technique, complication, device. They are very complete resources. And for um, no medical books, I'm currently reading Daring Greatly by Brené Brown. It's a journey that makes uh, us understand that we can become stronger by embracing vulnerability. We dare more greatly uh, when we acknowledge our fear. And that is goes back to what I just mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, uh, this conversation, about sharing uh, your uh, sharing shame, what uh, is is bad for you, what you don't want others to know, 
uh, with people you respect. You cannot just go out and just uh, yell it in the subway station, right? You need to have a um, healthy relationship and respectful uh, relationship with someone and then share your uh, darkest moment. And that way you can build and improve. So, Lorenzo, again, it's been an amazing uh, conversation. And also, you had an amazing career so far. I think it's an inspiration for many people because you literally have been able to learn so much, achieve so much, and you are still so young. So, a lot of exciting things to come. Uh, so, thank you so much for taking the time. Maybe if we can just finish by giving us like a two, your top two or three tips for the people who are like in your shoes, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, starting their journey into intervention, what would you recommend to them to become as successful as you have been? So thank you, Manus, for your kind words, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost. But then I would say that now we are in a very good moment because with technology, the go uh, like all these social medias, interacting, email, uh, like 20 years ago, many people did not have an email. It was much harder to reach out to like mm, the key opinion leaders in the field uh, mentors, etc. So um, you can just come and approach uh, us at the meetings and the conferences. Uh, so uh, there is also much more emphasis put in the mentorship, being a good mentor. And here, I think Bill uh, does a great job. And uh, you know, we have people who, even after the uh, the completion of their training, they come here, spend a week with us, and. Uh, it's not only about how to move the wires, what microcatheter to choose, when to use this and that. It's about uh, building a culture, uh, approaching the, uh, the leadership in your hospital to be successful, the medical leadership, the administrators, uh, how to approach your colleagues, uh, the non-invasive cardiologists, the surgeons, etc. So um, I think that it's not only uh, about the medicine, but it's also about soft skill and the EQ, emotional uh, quotient. And, and so, you know, I think it's a very favorable time now. So I invite anybody that has uh, uh, this uh, fire in their eyes, there's great to go after this uh, complex uh, uh, training and research to approach Manos, uh, uh, me, Bill, Kate, uh, all the key opinion leader in the field uh, at conferences on Twitter, email, whatever, cell phone, uh, shoot us a message. And I can guarantee all of us will be more than happy to help and uh, and uh, shepherd you along this uh, long but exciting journey. Wonderful. Again, thanks very much, Lorenzo, and we'll see you soon in one of the meetings. Thank you so much, Banos. It was great talking to you today. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 